sick of uh, you know this question but tell us a bit about uh, your history your, your I guess your uh, your background uh, how did you get to the electric universe theory and, and as to where you are today well I'm not actually sick of talking about it because I think it's important uh, because the electric universe is not just a scientific change it's a cultural change it requires a change in the way we educate people and the way we view ourselves and our place in the universe but um, it all started uh, when I was very young post-war uh, and in school, I was very interested in astronomy, so I used to bore the kids witless during show and tell with things that I'd discovered. And, of course, at high school, I thought I was going to be a scientist. I had uh, some rather interesting differences in my schooling to what most people would have experienced, and that is that post-war, new high schools were being built in the suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. And I was one of the lucky ones who ended up in a new high school in first form, and we were the top form all the way through the school. We had no students above us, which meant that I had good access to our teachers, and in particular, uh, one science teacher who used to lend me books by Fred Hoyle and other scientists uh, to read. And um, the result of that was that I was given more or less two sides to the story. I read Fred Hoyle's Steady State Universe, and then, of course, over the years, I learned about the Big Bang Universe. But the thing that really threw me was, uh, as a teenager, reading uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision, which is only the only, I think, recent example of the burning of a well-documented uh, book from a textbook publisher, Macmillan, uh, which was uh, burnt, had to be burnt, remainded, despite the fact that it was a bestseller for six months on the New York uh, Times a bestseller list. Wow. And the reason for that was the extreme pressure brought by astronomers, in particular Harlow Shapley uh, from Harvard and the Harvard clique, who boasted they'd never read the book, but it, it was obviously wrong because it disobeyed Newton's laws. Now, this is the kind of religious aspect of modern science, in particular cosmology, where beliefs uh, drive decisions rather than evidence and scientific investigation. Anyway, the book uh, was transferred to a popular publisher and it is still available today and I think was reprinted just recently. The thing about that book that really inspired me was that he was a fellow who had a broad education, the kind of education you got at the end of the uh, 19th and beginning of the 20th century, which gave you uh, the history and the classics and, as well as the science. And he was a guy who was also trained under one of Freud's pupils as a psychoanalyst. And he began to see that the stories in the creation stories around the world from all different cultures told essentially the same kinds of things and they were all obsessed with the planetary gods right and he showed me that you could actually use the modern forensic scientific approach to analyzing what was fact and what was fiction amongst these stories because of course uh, it uh, i mean it's been noted by many scholars uh, of, of myth, myth, mythological scholars i should say uh, who are doing comparative mythology, that these stories do have common elements. And, of course, the idea was that, well, maybe somehow these stories got transferred around the world. But uh, you can't do that with the Australian Aboriginals, for instance, and their stories also have the same characteristics. So he, using this forensic technique, you're able to sort out the best evidence. And he showed that you could do it. And uh, the thing that he proved for me was that Venus within human memory was a gigantic archetype of all comets. In other words, it's a new planet in the solar system. From that premise, he then made predictions before the space age, which were quite outrageous at the time, but every, every one of them was uh, later shown to be correct. One of them being, of course, that uh, Venus would be shown to be hot, almost incandescent. Well, no one, no one thought that when he made that prediction. 
He also said the moon would have remnant magnetism. No one thought to th uh, actually photograph the um, orientation of the rocks that the Apollo astronauts brought back. And of course, they were surprised that they were magnetized. It just goes on and on. The number of predictions he made uh, that were proven correct. But of course, the scientists uh, involved in those subjects said, oh, just lucky guesses. No, no, <laughs> you can't predict things that are so <laughs> off the wall from lucky guesses and get them all right. So this was the thing that inspired me. But when I went to university, I began asking my lecturers questions related to these subjects. And I found instead of a scientific and dispassionate uh, response, I got hostility. Or at the very least, I got answers that were, didn't refer to what I'd actually asked, but they were answers that they could give to a question that they could answer. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, typical of experts, I'm afraid to say. Uh, they're not prepared very easily to say, I don't know. Or that's interesting and I'll look into it. I didn't get any of that. I had people you know, turn on their heels and just walk away without even acknowledging the fact that I'd asked the question. So I began postgraduate research, in upper atmosphere research, uh, but I got very disillusioned and realized that as a heretic now, and I was becoming recognized as a heretic, um, there was no future in academia. And so I joined IBM and began uh, a career in computing, which I found the logic of computing and that rather interesting and uh, enjoyable. And so that was my career while I pursued the scientific questions in the background. And I think that sort of wraps up <laughs> where I came from. Very good, very <laughs> but, good. But the story uh, over the years, and I look back at the progress in the ideas, and it's like it's almost like a random walk, but um, I can chart the progress uh, and the people that I needed to see. And this is one of the aspects of the work that I did because I joined the Australian government after some years in IBM, mainly for the purpose of being able to travel the world and meet the people who I felt would uh, had the right ideas or on the right track. Right. And it was that that uh, got me to where I am now with the Electric Universe. There are key individuals along the way who provided uh, the next step in the or the next part of the big picture. Very good, very good. And yeah, well, I want to just, you know, real, real, real br briefly mention, uh, you know, talk about Velikovsky again. I, I was hoping to have read In the Beginning and also Worlds in Collision by the time of this uh, interview, but uh, I, I had a chance to read In the Beginning, uh, which I think was published <laughs> after. It was, I, don't, I think it was kind of an unfinished manuscript, uh, if I remember correctly, that one of his uh, old research assistants just kind of, you know, put out. Uh, That's and right. It was, uh, I mean, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard you mention Velikovsky and others, you know, in kind of the EU circles many times, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I used to be more more into the, this. This actually, this this uh, podcast kind of was was started based off of kind of consp conspiratorial subjects. And yes. reading Velikovsky's work, uh, like going back into kind of the, I guess maybe the occult sort of understandings of of, of you know what they were witnessing, it did kind of answer mm -hmm. some questions that I'd you know I, I hadn't looked I hadn't looked into that for years now. So it kind yes. of uh, it, it kind of answered answered some questions for me that I really didn't intend to get answered. So. Uh, it's really, really fascinating, fascinating stuff, and uh, yeah. it's not what you're told in uh, in, in school. It's definitely not. Uh, no, so it's I... good. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to mention that um, our last conference in um, August in Phoenix uh, was a, actually included a day on Velikovsky with some of the people who are still alive now who knew him personally. And I had met him, so I was included. And I talked about Velikovsky's influence in astrophysics because uh, he was the one who provided the key to uh, unlocking the real history of the solar system and the human race. And uh, that's available on the thunderbolts.info website. Uh, and we have all of the videos available and all of last year's um, the elegant simplicity of the electric universe video is available there for twenty nine dollars US. Right, right, and I would recommend uh, you know the, the listeners uh, you know definitely you know check that out, especially the Thunderbirds project. I can spend hours on that site and still have, <laughs> still have you know years of, of videos to watch. Uh, it's really really incredible stuff. So Thunderbolts.info and then also uh, Wall site Holoscience.com. Yeah, my, my my website I should say has sort of. Um, slowed down to a crawl because most of my activity is aimed at uh, the thunderbolts.info website now. So for the most up-to-date material, you go to that website. 
Very good, very good. So, so we've got about uh, nine minutes until this uh, until this very first break. About ten minutes, actually, uh, on mm-hmm. Truth Frequency Radio. Uh, so let's let's kind of uh, I guess uh, I'll, I'll kind of leave this this I, I do have an outline with a lot of questions, but I want to leave this kind of open ended for you, uh, so you can you know talk about what you want to talk about. So if you're if you're talking to folks who don't know anything about the EU, wh- where do you want to start? I think that uh, the most interesting thing for me was the historical background. In other words, what was it that the human race witnessed that frightened the pants off us and still results in a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder in humankind today? And you can see that in the doomsday scenarios, which we always seem to have. Right. One Uh, one just a few days ago, I think, was another doomsday prediction. Yeah, they're, they're still here with us today. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we've always got to have one. Uh, I've, I've been through uh, asteroid impact um, or comet impact, uh, ice age, uh, and now we've got global warming, of course. We're all going to die. Well, where does this fear come from? Also, the fear of comets. I mean, comets, uh, most people um, look at them if they manage to see one. Uh, not all of them are that visible. But to think that that could have had anything to do with the doomsday scenario, the end of the world, the end of life as we know it and everything, uh, it doesn't make any sense unless you actually go back and find out what the ancients were desperately trying to tell us. And they witnessed some really, really, I guess, uh, you know, look at just from Velikovsky's in the beginning, they witnessed, uh, and also just the creation stories, as you mentioned, there was some, Mm. some really insane stuff going on. Uh, oh, yes. And, and uh, I, it, I, I think that's that's kind of an interesting perspective there, because there, there is that uh, that kind of doom porn, uh, those doom porn scenarios always propagated today. There's this, mm. there's just this this I guess innate fear, maybe, uh, maybe not maybe not innate. That kind of leads to a different debate, but uh, but there there is kind of that fear for for the end of the world. Uh, and I think you yes. know Velikovsky offered some really valuable insight into well, well just, like where where did this where did this fear come from? And well, I guess his hypothesis was that well, it's something that's kind of ingrained in humanity because of all of the terrible things that you know uh, that we've had to you know go go through to get to the point we are today. Mm-hmm. One of the important aspects of that is that uh, Velikovsky, as a psychoanalyst, knew this. He said that any individual who has suffered uh, trauma that they cannot face up to suppress the memory. But he said subconsciously they try and uh, access it often by uh, some you know alternate means uh, and sometimes by reenactment well the alternate means these days is all of the doom and disaster movies we see and uh, you know the end of the world type things and we're going to be saved by some hero all of this is very mythological right. bronze age bronze age stuff <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know the the point of that is that the reenactment uh, of these doomsday scenarios is is warlike behaviour. It's destruction of your neighbours. You blame them for what happened because you've got no other recourse. You can't get up there and um, fiddle. You know, put the planets back in their right place. Uh, <laughs> So what do you do? You blame your neighbours and then you go to war and destroy them. Well, we just keep doing it and we've never known why. But once you understand it, Velikovsky felt, unless we understand that, we will never heal from the disasters uh, that uh, occurred to our and uh, you know, forgotten ancestors. And that is the most serious message I think he actually had to give us. Forget the science. I mean, the science uh, can take care of itself. It's the impact on the human psyche and the way we behave to each other and to the planet, because we also treat the planet as if uh, we're the gods and we can happily destroy it if we need, if we want to. And we've, we have some of that power now with nuclear weapons. So this is the real fear uh, that we should have is ourselves, you know, fear of ourselves. Right, right. Uh, I guess when it doesn't come to science, this is one of the issues with kind of the philosophic corruption of, of philosophy, you know, uh, mm. but, you know, look, looking inward, you know, looking inward rather than projecting those things outward uh, when it comes to, I guess, self-development and, and, and trying to, I guess, heal past wounds. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, and unfortunately, it seems like a lot of that's uh, faced outward. You know, I'm having these problems, therefore I'm going to blame you. I'm going to, you know, we're going to, you know, drone bomb somewhere. Or so, so just some, some really, really ter- terrible outcome. Uh, that's right. Yes. So, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that that's a very important aspect of it, uh, and it's 
one of the inspiring things about the electric universe is that it provides us with a new way of looking at ourselves and the universe. You know, modern science is devoted to try and make us feel safe. This is why uh, one of the reasons why Harlow Shapley and his mob at Harvard uh, wanted uh, Velikovsky's book burnt because this showed that the solar system is not a safe place necessarily. But of course, appealing to Newton's law doesn't solve anything because Newton's law doesn't give you a safe orderly universe. Uh, any deviation by any one body in that multi-body system is enough to throw the whole thing into chaos. But the astronomers never tell you that. Or if they do, they, they immediately change the subject. Um, there is no mechanism in Newtonian mechanics or in Einstein's gravitational theory to um, institute a stable, multi-bodied orbital system. Vanu means relative physical invulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution, any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, indirectly you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. Vanu will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vanu for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. In future issues, I hope you'll add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live. Out of sight and minds of those unwilling to let live. By people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL.